So good afternoon, everyone, to the Remote Pilot Ground School course. Catherine? Pardon? Pass back your essays? Yes, I will. I will. You have a hard time finding the place? Remember, the penalties start now for being late or absent. Matthew, what? Am I keeping what for dip between the two of them? These two classes are very separate. They're separate attendance and, and excused absences and unexcused absences. They're separate tests. They're separate grades. They're separate everything. Okay, introduction. The FAA has, over the last couple of years or so, they have struggled with defining the specific ideas behind drones and not only drone restrictions, but in general, how to handle the worldwide explosion of drone flying. And there have been, that, there have been so many manufacturers jump into the fray and so many hundreds of thousands of drones that have been sold that something has to happen. Well. I think what you're going to find is that even over a period of time since we've been sitting in this classroom, they probably have either changed their mind or revised some of their rules and regulations, and I'll get into that in a few minutes. But there's are two options in general. This is an, inter an in general introduction to the possibility you have available to you, but I'm going to warn you now that the next slide will say that the option on the left, Section 336, may or may not any longer be available. I've heard this afternoon from my, my office mate that he read somewhere that the FAA had done away with Section 336 and put everything under Part 107. So... If there is any confusion on the exam in December the, with regard to whether 336 is inactive or not, the FAA will make allowances for that. You will be told at the beginning of the exam if there is any ambiguity regarding the questions that are still on the exam, they might not have been able to change. So it's important to keep in mind that the process of drones and drone activity is an ongoing project. It's constantly changing. So just be aware that it's constantly changing. But in general, you're going to run into what you can do and what you can't do and what you have to do. And those three things should be uppermost in your mind, not only learning from now to December, but when it comes time to take the exam in December, the things that you can do and can't do and have to do. But for right now, for your importance and the fact that you are, I, th I think, all going to try to get a drone license in December, the one on the right, the option on the right, Part 107, is the most important one for you. That's the one you should concentrate on. That's the one you should pay attention to. Part 107. I'm going to show you the URL of where to go to get online to access Part 107, it has every description you'll ever need for what you can and can't do in drone flying, Part 107, and it's, a, it's a, an interactive site put out by the FAA, and I'll show you where that is and how to get to it, and I will actually access one, I believe I'll have a chance to access one right here from this terminal so you can see it on the screen. Everybody okay with, this, with the slide? <clears throat> I'm 
there are some people in the school here who have reported that it's from 55 grams to 55 pounds. Not true according to the FAA. According to the FAA, it is 0.55 pounds to 55 pounds. And until further notice, just get rid of that idea that it was 55 grams. It's not. It's 0.55 pounds, a little over half a pound. Okay, Matthew? You have to register every drone you get, every drone you buy, because every drone you buy has its own unique numbers, right? Yeah. So just assume that you are not going to be doing this as a hobby, because people are going to be willing to pay you for your time if you have a drone pilot license. Any other questions about this particular slide? Ask them now. Remember, there's no such thing as a bad question. The only the only unfortunate question is the one that's never been asked. Okay, here's this special rule I just mentioned. All you have to do is look at it. You don't have to pay attention to it. All you have to do is say to yourself, okay, it may or may not be in existence, but it doesn't necessarily pertain to you. And if there's any ambiguity, the FAA will make allowances for that in the final test. But just be aware that as a hobby or recreation, it's fluid. That particular part of the FAA requirements is still undergoing analysis. But you're not going to worry about that anyway because you're going to get a pilot license. You're going to be operating under Part 107. That you want to keep in mind. That should be burned into your brain as the one FAA regulation that you are going to live with between now and December, and then even after that, because it'll be so much a part of your operational thought process that you'll go to sleep at night dreaming about Part 107. Okay, so I'm going to give you some upfront ideas so that you can put the emphasis where it belongs. Here is the FAA's own, own breakdown of how the questions, what, what category the questions will be asked, and what percentage of the final test will contain what category of questions. This you want to make note of because it will help you study. You don't want to spend a lot of time studying, for example, about loading and performance if you give up time in regulations and air, airspace requirements. So you want to put your time where it belongs prioritize your time. Remember what I've said so many times before. Time is your only non-renewable resource. Once it's gone, it's gone forever. You can't get it back. You can't plead with somebody to return that hour you lost. So don't lose hours. Make good use of them. And 60 questions, all, almost every FAA exam I've ever taken for all my ratings have been 60 questions, multiple choice. And I would expect all of you to score higher than 85%, because by the time this class is over with, you'll have that much information in your brain. Remember, I want you to succeed. You will succeed or else. So look at operations. Look at that category. So I would start, I would certainly put my priority in operations, and then I would go from there to regulations and airspace, and then some weather, and then some loading and performance. Loading has to do with two things mainly these days. It has to do with photography, and it has to do with Amazon's intention to deliver packages by way of drones. So the photography, the, the camera equipment on board, can be either small little cameras like we have on our current drones here, or it can be big Nikon or Canon cameras that have 
big lenses and long focal lengths and are extremely high detailed. And even then, you probably would not exceed 55 pounds because 55 pounds, just think about that. That is a heavy weight. When you go home, try to find something that's 55 pounds. Maybe, maybe you'll have a, 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 a brother or a sister that weighs 55 pounds. Pick them up. Or you, if you're, oh no, you're not old enough for grandkids, never mind. Everybody done with this one? <clears throat> this is important for your time. Ready? Okay. Here is the FAA website. And I and that is the URL, but the easy way to do it is just to uh, probably go to ecfr.gov and then from there you can just put in part 107. But as you can see, Everything is there for the final test. So if you just studied this website and you knew the answers to this, I mean, you knew the information presented in this website, I would guarantee you would pass the exam in December because it has every question answered that they're going to ask you on the exam. For example, definitions. Right away, it goes immediately to definitions. Or back to the top, alcohol or drugs, right up there. Back to the top, operation in prohibited or restricted areas. So you can see that it, it, it's interactive enough so that you can quickly get the information, go back and get more information, or later on when you're not quite sure about a particular aspect of the restrictions or what you're allowed to do, you go to this website. I would, I would consider this a part of your learning process between now and December to have this accessible either on your cell phone or at your computer at home. Okay, eligibility. Name one. Oh, don't tell me. We just went over this yesterday. What's, what's the eligible for a drone pilot? Huh? 16 years old, right? What else? Pardon? Yeah, well, more than that. Speak, read, write, and understand English, right? Let's take the first one. 13-year-old to register a drone. And my PowerPoint presentation is the kind of things that you're going to have on the final exam. So... If you look at that and you say, well, I don't worry, worry about 13 years to register a drone, but if that's on the final exam, you certainly want to remember it, right? But there are only two ages to remember, that and 16 years old to have a drone license. So it should be easy to remember. You only have two numbers to remember, 13 to, license, to register, 16 to fly. To fly legally. I mean, to fly as a commercial pilot. And physically and mentally fit for proper operation. If you had a real bad cold and your nose was runny and your eyes were runny and you were sneezing and coughing, would you be flying a drone? No. If you had a nervous breakdown and they put you in a <laughs> they put you in a van and took you off to a hospital somewhere, would you fly a drone? No. So it's unlikely that that mentally unfit unless you happen to have a particular rage against somebody, like you have road rage, you don't want to have drone rage. 
and start going after somebody with your drone. And the FAA lists only those three eligibilities with the added one I put in there of 13 years old to register the drone. But the important ones are the second, third, and fourth listed. And that website we accessed has that information in there. Now, if you happen to be a foreign national, you're going to have to do a little bit more paperwork in order to be given a license. Matthew? Does that include what? I, I, it doesn't include being a U.S. citizen because a foreign person can operate drones. They can get a drone license. They just have to go through a little bit more. So here's what happens. You take the test and you pass it. Now, that information is put on a, a site we call IACRA, I-A-C-R-A. It's a site where I have to utilize it to get my students to get their license. Everybody that's going to get a license in anything with the FAA has to go to that site. You register. Your information is put in there, the, pet, the test you passed. That information then is sent to the FAA and to the Transportation Security Agency because they have to vet you. They have to find out whether you are a terrorist or not, whether you are in this country illegally. They, they'll go through a process and say, okay, we approve this as license. Then and only then will you get your license. So it's not only is it passing the test, but then that information then goes to several agencies under the TSA, but it also goes to the FAA. Then they look up in their records to see whether you exist at all. So it's a process, and then the, the foreign people have to go through a little bit more difficulty because they're in this country, and the, the Transportation Security Agency is going to want to find out if they have a legal right to be here, how long are they planning to be here, what are they going to do when they're here, are they going to school, or are they working, or what? Okay. So that applies to be, read, write, speak, and understand, because it applies to anybody who's going to fly a drone. <clears throat> so under definitions, it's interesting because they don't list a lot of definitions. I would have listed a lot of definitions, including the FAA, PIC, VFR, all of those mnemonics, all of those abbreviations that you will begin to see, like VLOS. Does anybody know what VLOS stands for? You should. We talked about it. You've had to fly drones under that restriction. Visual line of sight. Remember? Okay. So definitions. This comes right out of the FAA website. And by now, having flown, a few, uh, flown drones a few times, you have a pretty good idea of these definitions already. You might have to <coughs> sharpen up your definition a little bit. And you know what a control station is, right? It's the thing you're holding your hand. It's the one that you maneuver the, the uh, drone with. The small unmanned aircraft is 55 pounds, including everything attached to that drone. So if you have a heavy camera, that, that camera is going to be there as well. But I can tell you that with few exceptions, you are probably not going to exceed 55 pounds. Even if you buy a big $2,000 drone, 
and put a heavy Canon or a Nikon camera underneath it, you're not likely to get over 55 pounds. But what happens over 55 pounds? Who flies drones over 55 pounds? Who? NASA? The Air Force? Oh, I'm sorry, Adele? Okay, so remember this now, and, and that's a point that Adele just brought up. Every restriction that I'm going to have up here, I'm also going to show you <clears throat> a list of the waivers for those restrictions where you can get around them. It's kind of interesting because the list of restrictions and the list of waivers is the same length. It's the same list. Just know that on your final exam, there probably will be questions just like this. What is the definition of small unmanned aircraft? And it will have three options. And there's only one option that will be the correct answer. So be careful of the wording. Be careful of the wording. I think you all have gotten a lot better since August on the test that I've given you about being careful about reading the question carefully. Well, you've got to do even better with the FAA exam. They have a way of asking a question that might be a little tricky if you don't read it correctly, if you, if you rush through the question. And what did I say is the worst thing for an exam? Being hurried. Trying to go, go through any exam too fast, and that's one way to come out with a bad score. Okay, everybody got this? Okay. Any questions on this? Remember that website. When you all go home, I urge you to find that website, <clears throat> or I will make sure that I have pieces of paper tomorrow to hand out to you with the website on it. You want to make that your remote control Bible for your final exam. Okay, documentation, recreational only. And this is interesting because just to register it, you have to fill out a form. And on that form, you have to testify that you will follow these rules. That's how important they are. There are little boxes next to each one of them. You have to check the box to make sure that you agree that you are going to abide by all of those restrictions. You don't necessarily have to write them down. <clears throat> but you can get on the FAA website, go to Part 107, and click on Drone Registration, and it will show you what you have to do. But there's nothing new there, is there? Everybody's familiar with it? You see that? VOS, VLOS, Visual Line of Sight. Okay. Now, there were two options, right? There was an option to register it as recreational, and there was an option to register it as commercial. You all, if you get your license in December, are going to be afforded the privilege of being a commercial drone operator. Okay, so here's what you have to agree to. I want to point something out here. <clears throat> it says here, I will only fly in Class B airspace. What is the visibility? Restrictions.
What is the visibility requirement to fly a drone? Three miles. Did you agree okay, to fly Class G airspace? Doesn't mean that you can fly under Class G cloud clearance and visibility requirements. <coughs> because Class G says one mile in clouds, but we're going to cover visibility and cloud clearance for drones here shortly, and you'll see the difference. Okay, night operation. Just flat out, you can't fly at night, period. Pardon? You okay? Are you okay with that one? Okay. Well, you said you're okay with that one. I'll let you look at it after class. Okay, no flying at night. However, there's a, in number two, or, no, or B, it says you can fly in what is called civil twilight. Now, tw civil twilight is kind of a funny situation because it's not night, but it's not day. And I'm going to show you th what that means. Okay. Whatever sunrise is, what, 7 o'clock in the morning, maybe sunset at 6 o'clock in the evening? Sunrise to sunset is daylight. That's a day. However, in all of aviation, powered aircraft, the aircraft I fly, gliders, everybody, from 30 minutes before sunrise is called civil twilight. And from 30 minutes after sunset, it's called civil twilight. And you can fly in civil twilight if, if, let me go back to that previous one, if, the remote pilot in command may, oh, if it has lighted anti-collision lighting visible for at least three miles. Now, I'm not sure I understand three miles for you because you can't see that far. But it's certainly true that late in the evening or early in the morning for other aircraft to see that drone. I believe the flashing lights on the hub sand drones that we have here, those red and blue flashing lights, I believe are, meet the requirement for being able to fly those in civil twilight. But there will be a question on the final exam about civil twilight. I'll guarantee you, of the 60, one of those questions will have this to deal with. So just remember, it's 30 minutes before sunrise and it's 30 minutes after sunset. That's, those two segments of 30 minutes consist of civil twilight. One more look at this graphic. My great drawing. That's all you have to remember. Civil twilight is a 30-minute period before sunrise and a 30-minute period after sunset. And I guarantee you that question will be on the exam. Okay, here we go to visibility and cloud clearances. Three mile visibility. And this is going to be on the question two on the exam. Slant distance. Everybody know what a slant distance is? Nobody, huh? That's a slant distance. So which is longer, horizontal distance down to the bottom, right here, or a slant distance? Which is longer? Okay, isn't this a Pythagorean theorem? Did you ever hear of that very beautiful thing called a 3, 4, 5 right triangle? Right, so here you got 300, 400, so what's that distance? 500, that's right. It's a beautiful theorem. Pythagoras was just great. Three, four, five, right triangle. It could be 300, 400, 500. It could be 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, right? So anyway, the slant distance is the only thing that matters to the FAA because the FAA assumes that that drone's going to be in the air when you have to look at it. If it's on the ground, who cares, right? <clears throat> so that question, slant distance, is going to be there. I'll guarantee it. 
it'll be a question of, you know, what is the visibility required, such and such. And it'll, it'll sneak in the word slant, or it won't sneak in, but in one of the options that you choose at the bottom, it's going to have slant in there somewhere. Just remember, slant distance is the thing that's, that determines your visibility for drone flying. And we have our old standard, except one is missing, right? And we talked about which one is missing. And you all, I think, answered that, or most of you answered that correctly. And that is, what's missing is the 1,000 feet above the cloud. So here's the cloud clearance requirements. You have the slant distance of three miles, and you have the cloud clearance requirements of 500 below and 2,000 horizontally. And I'm observing more enthusiasm for note-taking and paying attention than I have in the previous class and the previous quarter. And I think it's because you all recognize how important this is to you personally that by the end of this semester, you're going to have something that no one can ever take away from you. Once you get that pilot license, it's yours to keep and to make money with. So no wonder you're paying really good attention and making good notes. I love it. You all ready? No. Emergency operations. This is something that you should, I don't expect you to memorize this. What I expect you to remember is that there are certain times when certain operations can very quickly ignore drone restrictions. And so if there's a question on the exam, and I don't know if there is one, but probably, if there's a question on the exam that has to do with can a drone operator overcome some restriction if it's a, if it's a firefighting operation or if it's search and rescue or law enforcement or whatever, and the answer is yes. They are allowed to immediately violate restrictions that have been put in place if their operation falls into these categories. But I'd rather have your, I'd rather have your memory devoted to more specific things. And just in general, I want you to consider that there are areas of emergency or, or operations that require restricting or avoiding restrictions now. They can't wait to call the FAA and say, hey, can we violate this restriction? They're allowed to do that under the basis of emergency operations. So just write a note to yourself that has to do something with emergency operations can take priority over other operations. Waivers to standard restrictions. Okay, here are the... Here are the waivers that you can get from the FAA on various operations. So all of those things that we talked about are restrictions to flight. One way or another, you can get a waiver from the FAA, but sometimes it takes months. So what the FAA came up with for people, for example, who wanted to fly a drone, let's say the president was going to arrive at LAX in Air Force One, and the news broadcast wanted to have a drone watch this aircraft come in for a landing. But it was tomorrow, and it was unannounced ahead of time, so the drone operator did not, did not have an opportunity to apply, which usually took several weeks or months. So the FAA put into operation something called LANCE, L-A-A-N-C, and there are about 10 companies that are allowed to grant immediate approval of those kinds of operations if you describe to them what, what you want to do, when and where and for how long, they are authorized by the FAA to come back and give you that approval now. So, and you'll get approval in real time. So these waivers, from your point of view, at least until you start getting more commercial, 
are waivers that I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about too much because it takes too long to get a waiver for your operations. But if you're with a news, if you get hired by a news company, like in Fresno, if Channel 47 hires you to be one of the PIC drone operators, which is possible, you will know that, and I'll tell you, I'll show this in a later, in a later presentation, that there is something called L-A-A-N-C, Lance, and it has to do with 10 companies, I believe 10 or maybe even 12 by now, who have been given the authorization by the FAA to give immediate approval for overcoming restrictions, even to the extent of flying in Class B airspace over the top, for example, of a 747 landing at, at LAX. And they were pointing out that this is extremely beneficial now because it used to take three to four months to get a waiver approved. And, of course, if you get news that Air Force One's going to land at LAX tomorrow, getting, a, getting a, an approval in three or four months doesn't do you any good. Everybody done with this one? Okay, are there any questions? Now, nearing the end of the day, you ought to have some questions. If not, that means I did a magnificent job of overwhelming your memory bank. Nobody has any questions? Oh, Adele? Keep it down. Jesus! Well, I mean, anything in the military is going to have, you know, as far as small is concerned. I, there are probably so many applications, <clears throat> I probably just couldn't come up with them all. But, you know, you mentioned one, right? Right? Um, agriculture? Right. The agriculture would be another one. Hey, you guys. You want to stand up and tell everybody what you were talking about? Sal, you and Umberto. Pardon? Kiara? Would you make a comment? No? Okay. Anybody else? Questions? Okay, I'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs> Don't forget, Catherine. Hold it. Well, I want you – certainly, if you could take notes, that's fine. That would certainly help you score on your exam. But you're required to read that material now and tomorrow. Andrew? If you take notes by yourself, you want to take the quiz right away? Sure. Every note you take, <coughs> you're allowed to use on the quizzes except for the test. There are three tests and a final exam. So there are four of them that are closed book. But the other, the quizzes are going to be all open book. <laughs>